Good. There. Now, now you have to clap, so now you can hear it. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, oh, you are just a machine. I know. This is my uh, third talk. This is my third talk. Uh, I, I, I talk a lot, uh, <laughs> occasionally for a living. But thank you so much for coming to uh, the final of these three talks. This is, uh, uh, for those of you who are new, uh, my name is Andy Boyle. That's what I look like, in case you also can't look up here. Um, there's some of my contact information. Uh, this is a training that's through the Society of Professional Journalists as well as the Google News Lab. Uh, I'm working through SPJ. I don't work for Google. I work for SPJ. Uh, and that's important because it means I can occasionally talk shit about Google. Uh, in this instance, uh, I'm using Google Slides, uh, and they don't work right now uh, in Chrome. So I have to open them up in Safari. So that's hilarious. Um, uh, <laughs> but otherwise, I can't see my notes. So uh, this final talk is about uh, data journalism, what data journalism is, fighting for public records, telling stories, uh, using data and records and that sort of stuff. It's kind of like this higher level of, of journalism that allows you to give your journalism a little bit more heft. Because sometimes people will tell you something, and you you just take it at face value. But there's actually ways to prove or disprove the things that they're saying. Um, and so we'll kind of walk through some of that. I also wrote a book. It's called Adulthood for Beginners. came through uh, Penguin Random House. It's like a real book. Uh, buy it, 12 copies. It's mandatory. Um, that was a joke. Uh, how many uh, reporters actually use data? It's actually a lot. Um, this was a, uh, a study that was done by the Google News Lab at Policy Biz. 42% of journalists surveyed said they use data regularly to tell stories. And I'll get a little bit more in depth on what I mean when I use the word data. Uh, but the amount of organizations that have dedicated data journalists, it's about 51%. Um, and a digital news organization, it's about 60 And a lot of times, it's like that one person who does all of it. Um, and that's how a lot of these places think. Whereas my thinking is everybody who does journalism can learn something from these skills. Doesn't mean you're doing it all the time. It means on occasion, something might pop up where you can use some of this stuff to bolster your normal beat reporting. The normal sort of reporting you do, you shouldn't be thought of as, you're the data gal, you're the data guy. No, it's just another tool in your tool set. Like somebody wouldn't go, oh, you're the noun person. <laughs> you know? Like, no. Exactly. Yeah, you're all, it's, it's Mr. Adverb. You know, it's, just think of this as another tool to help you do better journalism and tell stories that are richer uh, and more full. Uh, and the big subjects these folks report on a created survey politics, finance, uh, and then investigative reporting. So, politics and finance, shocker, they're pretty close to each other. Uh, and investigative reporting uh, is usually like much more bigger, longer-term projects where they use the service stuff. Um, and there's a lot of challenges. 49% um, of data stories are created in a day or less, which should tell you they can be done pretty quickly. So they're not like these monument. They're not always monumental undertakings that take months and years of work. Um, a lot of people thought it was this specialty skill that required extensive training. It doesn't require extensive training. Uh, just like remember how you had to learn how to write an article or take a photo? That was kind of extensive training. But it's also something that you learn throughout the rest of your career. You're always getting better. You're always growing. Uh, and 20% of those people surveyed had to build their own in-house data visualization tools. Uh, what's great, if you were in some of the earlier talks, there's a lot of free stuff that already exists to allow you to tell stor uh, stories using data visually. Um, and then also for some newsrooms, there's an unclear return on investment because they think it takes a significant amount of time and resources. I would counteract that by saying people come to read what you write because it is good, because you do a great job, because uh, you are trying to tell the best kind of stories you possibly can. Using some of these data journalism skills in your regular normal journalism makes what you write, what you report on, how you tell stories better which means your audience is going to like what you do better. So uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank some of these folks, uh, Lena Gregory, Mike Riley, and then also the organizations, NICAR, IRE. That's the National Institute for Computer System Reporting and Investigative Reporters and Editors Group. Uh, because I'm, I'm cribbing some of these things from this talk. It's from various things, from talks they've given, and also just some stuff, trains I've learned from these folks over the years. So again, I want to uh, give credit where credit is due. Um, so one area I want to start with is the phrase data journalism. 
What is it? Uh, a lot of people use it, and in my brief career of being a journalist, uh, and that's only about like 12 years, this phrase has changed like three or four times. It used to be called computer-assisted reporting. Um, and then it became like programmatic reporting, and then precision journalism. Uh, and then now it's just kind of like data journalism. But even when they started calling it data journalism, that has meant like three or four different things. And so uh, to kind of uh, set a baseline of what I mean, uh, think of it as the new possibilities that arise when you combine traditional journalistic skills. So being curious and skeptical, um, and asking questions, talking to people, finding powerful narratives, um, and the explosion of new digital information and tools. So just think of it as good journalism, interesting new tools. They go together. It's kind of a broader, broader look. Um, like here's, I'm going to show you some quick examples of this. So data stories themselves can be about any topic, but often they focus on two things: trends or exceptions. So you like, it's very interesting to write about an exception. This is an exception. Why Pinellas County is the worst place in Florida to be black and go to public school. Exception. Also a trend, um, which is uh, a lot of policies are systemically racist. Um, so again, you have kind of two stories in one. Um, so a story about rising income equality or affirmative action bans across America are both data stories. They tell us about trends using statistics and data analysis, but a story about like one university that saddles its students with thousands of dollars of debt or a couple of doctors that charge way more for the same procedures than other doctors, those show us the outliers and exceptions. Um, I had an old editor who told me there are two kinds of stories. Same old shit and holy shit. <laughs> you do the same old shit to discover the holy shit. You build the skills by doing those sort of things to know when you find the good one, you know how to really do it. That's kind of what you think about this. Sometimes same old shit is bad, like the same, it's, it's terrible and that's normal. Um, like, uh, like sometimes people are like, oh, you know, we only had 600 murders this year. It's like, you still had 600 murders. Like, it's still bad. But people are like, yeah, but it was 650, so it's better. It's like, yeah, but it's still bad. So uh, again, that's also the same old shit uh, compared to holy shit. Uh, this is a project that uh, one of my buddies, Alex Richards, did. Um, he actually lives right over there. Uh, this was, the city said they had installed all these red light cameras um, to, uh, well, first of all, they said they were putting them in like really high traffic areas where there's a lot of accidents. Uh, well, you can take that, you can take that data and actually be able to go, where do the accidents occur and where are the cameras? Oh, guess what? They're not in high crash areas. So you're lying, bullshit artists. Uh, and then another thing they said was, well, this money is going to be, you know, it's, it's around a lot of schools. Is it? They were able to take data, prove, no. And then they were also were saying, like, well, one of the reasons is we're going to take that money, and it's going to flow into being able, able you know, all of these other things we want to do. You can actually look and see where the money goes. No, it does not. So again, uh, holding truth to power. Um, data stories can also, they can take on multi, uh, multitude of forms. Sometimes they appear in a form of like a long traditional uh, investigative story, which provides context and specific numbers. Um, sometimes it might be a chart or interactive graphic that illustrates a particular point. Other times it might just be an interactive database that allows a user to actually search for their own community or uh, something like that, to tell, the, tell their own story. So this is a, what the old uh, Chicago homicides uh, page looked like. Uh, it doesn't work anymore. I built this. Uh, they've since uh, moved to something different. But this told a story, which is everyone's just like, Chicago is this incredibly high crime place. It's Chirac. It's dangerous. If you walk down the street, you're going to get you're going to get mugged and thrown into the water. Uh, when at, when all actuality, it's a handful of neighborhoods that are very high crime. Um, but the more of the narrative is the people that are being shot are usually poor, they're usually black, and they're usually in the drug trade. And a lot of these neighborhoods, they're also very poor. They have very low economic opportunities. They have very poor schooling. They have a lot of other issues that lead to that. So a lot of times they're just like, Chicago is this crazy dangerous place. Chicago is a very dangerous place in a handful of neighborhoods, specifically if you stand on a street corner and sell snortable heroin. Then it's a really, really dangerous uh, uh, place. But 
for a large majority of it, it's not. People do get caught in the crossfire in a lot of these neighborhoods as well. But again, it's a lot of neighborhoods where people don't regularly go, which is also part of the problem that leads to some of the other economic problems. So data journalism sometimes is about helping people understand what's important about the data. So you might just say 789 homicides uh, with context and showing where those homicides occur, you can tell more of a story. It's not that people are being gunned down on Michigan Avenue because they used to be uh, in the 1930s uh, during like some of the beer wars, people were killed in the middle of the streets. There was one alderman race, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, I think 39 people were killed because a different uh, beer baron like ran a different alderman and they murdered each, like, each other's campaign workers uh, until they killed the guy running for alderman. So he didn't have anybody running against him. That's what it used to be like uh, 80, 90 years ago. So there's some more context, which you can't see on this map. Um, these are a couple projects uh, that we can link to later. Uh, but it's a, it asks a couple questions, like how much is an arm worth? That is this uh, cool chart that, well, I'll just show it. Sometimes it gets a little hard to get back into these uh, talks. Uh, like depending on where you are, if you lose an arm in Nevada, you get 859 grand. Illinois, only 439,000. Why? Like that's nuts. Like why is it different in one place than another? Um, oh. uh, which emergency room will see me the fastest? And it's broken. That's okay. Uh, is my doctor taking money from drug companies? Fun project. Look up your doctor. My doctor's not in here, but look up your own. And then, is this doctor prescribing me that drug pretty regularly? Something people might want to know. And man, were doctors pissed off about this project. Uh, rightfully so. Um, but again, like this guy, here's all this money that he got paid from all of these other, uh, all these other companies. Wow. That could be a royalty. Right. They don't get royalties for prescribing stuff, but <laughs> they'll just get money from these companies to be like, you should promote my stuff. And then the doctors go, don't worry, we, we're objective. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a project I did a decade ago uh, where I found uh, parking ticket hotspots in Little Rock, Arkansas. This is a very fun project. What I had wanted to find was the car that got the most parking tickets in the city. And what I discovered uh, was kind of like low C corruption in that um, if you see on this little map, you see that Capitol Avenue where all those black lines are, uh, that's where everyone gets parking tickets. Because what I discovered is that is where the federal courthouse is. Federal courthouse doesn't have a big enough parking lot for all those jurors. Federal courthouse tells their jurors, just park on the street, don't put any money in any of the meters. Because the federal government will pay for your parking ticket when you have jury duty. So instead of building a new parking garage to house all these people, they just say, tough shit, we'll just pay the city. So what does the city do? They have a guy that goes down and writes hundreds of parking tickets every single day on that street. Uh, and the city makes a ton of money. Like you might think, well, maybe just don't write the parking tickets. And the city would go, no, we make a ton of money doing this. And so I followed the guy who did this because I also found out who's the, like, I found out because I'm like, who writes the most parking tickets? And I found them. And I'm like, why? He's like, oh, it's a, these jurors. They don't have, they just, you know, they get their parking tickets repaid. I was just like, holy shit, that's crazy. I also found the car that got the most parking tickets. And I found where it almost always parked, literally parked five feet from the entrance of a parking garage. But I did the math. The amount of parking tickets this car got, uh, and it was like a red sports car, and I'm gonna make an assumption it was a dude. Uh, also, like the bumper sticker was like, it was dumb. Um, the sports car person paid less with the fines than he would have paid parking in this parking garage. So it had an economic incentive to just be like, to hell with it. That's how they get for the sports car. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and so those are some of the interesting stories I was able to find by using that data. Again, uh, like, Data journalism isn't magic. I got this data, found a bunch of stuff, but then what did I have to do? Make phone calls, go with people, walk around. Like I still had to do that normal journalism um, that is good journalism. So you might be asking like, well, why should I care 
Um, well, because data can help you answer questions that regular reporting can't do, or it would take literally a million years. Like how fast computers can like add stuff up. Think of how hard it is like to add, what's like five plus seven plus eight plus nine plus 12? Exactly, a computer would have already had the answer. I don't even remember the numbers I said. Uh, but a computer would remember the numbers and be able to do the, uh, do the addition. So you can automatically put yourself in position to do stories that other journalists can't do or your competition can't do, especially at the local level. Uh, so sometimes the data can be hard to collect. And so all the examples that I showed you, uh, there was an effort to get the data. Uh, sometimes you have to collect it yourself. Sometimes it comes from the government and you have to reformat it, do a bunch of other stuff. Um, and I'm not gonna go all together through that. Uh, but sometimes you have to scrape it off uh, really annoying websites like if this one still works. Like this, oh, like this one. Ugh. Like you can just do a search. Oh, does it work? And so now you have like, oh, wow, why can't you just put all of them on one page? Well, because that'd be too easy. And the contractor that built this, like, wouldn't have probably got more money because they're screwing over the people that actually want to find out information. Um, so again, it's like, oh, does this mean I have to learn how to code? It also said you asked for more than 5,000. Yes. So it only be first ones. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. When, when to me, I'd be like, just give me a thing to download all. Um, so you might be asking this, you know, like, oh, does this mean I have to learn how to program? Kind of, sort of, not really. There's so many tools out there that can do a lot of the really heavy lifting for you that you just click, click, click. If you would like to go more in depth, you can, you do not have to. Um, but what I'll be showing are some of the very basic things um, that can kind of get you started and trick you into uh, programming without knowing that you're even programming. Um, another thing you get with speed, uh, if, you're, if you're doing any sort of programming, and by programming I mean like writing like four things. Uh, they can help you do a million things faster than you can do by hand, including processing, analyzing, and formatting data. Um, it can also give you access to more stuff. So like that thing I showed you, that where it was like, oh, you 5,000 requests, you, you, I can't give you the data, tough. Well, if you had a program, you could write a little programmatic thing that would search it in such a way that it would still give you all the data, and trick them into giving you this data. Uh, and again, there's a lot of tools that take the programming out of this. So there are like browser extensions and a bunch of other stuff that can do this for you. Uh, but let's back up a little bit um, because even though I've talked about data journalism, it's good to actually say, what is data? And I'm going to try to keep this talk outside of the general realm of the highly technical, but just kind of telling you at like a ground level what it is. So if at any point I say anything that doesn't make sense or if I'm going too fast, raise your hand, ask a question. We're all in this together. There are no bad questions, only a bad presenter. Uh, so one thing I want to start with is spreadsheets. I don't know if this will open yep, because it is not Chrome. <laughs> but I will pull that over here. And I'll go to my drive. And I'm going to show you a spreadsheet. Who here has ever worked with a spreadsheet or opened a spreadsheet before? Awesome. So you kind of have like the basic idea of how it works. So I'm going to make a spreadsheet about cats. So cats have names, they have color, they have weight, they have uh, hometown, and they have favorite band. And we're just gonna come up with some names. John, Mary, Garcia, Nathan. Cupcake. Cupcake. Oh. <laughs> color, red, red, yellow, brown, invisible. <laughs> And then wait, and notice I'm just gonna I'm just gonna write a number. What does that wait mean? Who knows? Diabetic cat. Yeah. <laughs> Hometown. Um, that's a funny joke. Uh, <laughs> very funny. Uh, and then favorite band. So. I'm going to open this up a little bit, make that bigger, and then just to make it correct, there. Uh, so what I've done is, this is the basics of 
not only how all of the internet works, but this is how almost all data works. So if, ever, if anyone's ever talking about like a big fancy database, it's this on a bigger level. That's all that it is. It's just a bunch of spreadsheets. So don't ever let anybody act as if they're all fancy because they are just like, oh, it's a bunch of data. I don't think you'd understand. You'd be like, it's just like a bunch of spreadsheets, right? You're like, well, yeah. It's like, okay, stop being an asshole. <laughs> um, but this is what it's like. And so you have uh, different fields. So you have like the name field, color, weight, hometown, favorite band. And then you have rows. So this row, one single unit, has all of that information. And now if you notice some stuff around here, this says weight. This could also just all of a sudden be height. It's not as if the numbers below it mean anything. We put meaning on it. And again, it says 12. 12 what? Inches? Meters? Yards? Uh, same thing when it was weight. Is that pounds, ounces, kilograms? Again, that, that information is usually not always stored in the same thing. Uh, this hometown, it could have just said Sioux City. OK, Sioux City what? There could be maybe another field that's like hometown state. Um, favorite band, Bruce Springsteen. OK. Bruce Springsteen solo, or Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. Um, you, you know, that sort of stuff. This is the basics of how data looks. Uh, and if you can understand this, guess what? You are incredibly talented enough to do all the other sort of data journalism that everybody else can do. So give yourselves a round of applause, because you're awesome. Now let me go back to my, my talk, if I can find my notes again. Uh, so yeah, it's it's even with like even with this data, uh, who says it's cats? You can just decide it's, like, it's not cats. This is uh, people running for the forty second alderman ward. You know, it's John, Mary Garcia, Nathan, Jesus, and Cupcake. I'm voting. For, I'm go Cupcake. Yeah. Uh, but this is also data: emails, texts, website visits, letters, traffic tickets, crime, weather, pet registrations, menus, Tinder matches, batting averages, film reviews. All of this can be broken down and stored into the same way of that cat information. Like an email. Email has like a headline, who sent it, text, signature. Uh, website visits. I know um, a, a reporter who did a project out in Florida where um, he had noticed a lot of city council members were just staring at their laptops during city council meetings. And what he did was they were all using government pro uh, laptops. He was able to figure out what their login information was through public records requests. He was able to get all of their site traffic. So he was able to look at what they were looking at and when during a public meeting. What? Uh, excuse me? What? Uh, well, one person was looking at golf clubs on eBay uh, <laughs> while they were discussing this really important zoning issue. Um, and this might shock you, but this is like 12 years ago. The, they were just like, I wasn't. No, you weren't. You did it wrong. You know, fake news. Uh, and so, again, that's the sort of stuff that you can start doing. And what I like to say is, like, I want you to get into what I call a data frame of mind. Um, oh, uh, I've already kind of explained what a database is. Um, but uh, you want to get, like, into this data frame of mind when it comes to, like, public records and what's public, um, especially in America. And I think the public records are one of the most powerful tools that journalists have. Um, much stronger than the ability to write like a really snarky tweet. Um, and sometimes these can be a little bit more powerful than even like really great photos. Uh, so public records are what get you to amazing stories. They also, um, what you can use to help keep government agencies accountable and people accountable, people running for public office. Uh, there was an old advisor of mine in college. Uh, he worked out in Florida. Florida has just really good public records laws. Uh, but I wish most of the nation would uh, uh, follow. Um, but uh, he, w he was like a reporter for this small town and had to fill like a page of news every day back in the 70s. And this is right after a lot of these public records laws had, had come, to, come to power. Um, and his buddy was just like, let's go down to the city hall and just get a bunch of uh, the reimbursement forms that like, city council members fill out. And he was like, why? He's like, I don't know, because we can't. And so they go down there, and the city clerk's like, what do you want for? The guy's like, you, I don't know, but give it to us. He's just like, well, we need to know what you want them for. He's like, well, show me in the law where I can tell you that. And they were just like, nah. So they gave it to him. And what they found was every single city council member was always reimbursing 
uh, for uh, like dinner at the same restaurant regularly and like all the time. And so what he was able to figure out was by going to that restaurant at that time, they were meeting before every city council meeting to discuss everything. And what he had noticed was almost every vote was like 7-0, 7-0, 7-0. Everyone was like always unanimous. So he shows up with like a photographer, takes a photo of them all sitting at a table, just like, hi, uh, this is illegal, what's up? <laughs> and you know, next day I like ran, ran the photo of them all like, you know, and like totaling their expenses and how this is a, breaking the law and they, they have a forum and all of this sort of stuff. And, uh, they since for they what they probably did was they just didn't file their reimbursements anymore, uh, so they might still be breaking the law. Uh, but that's the thing I brought up with uh, my brother-in-law. He's a uh, he's a state representative in South Dakota, and I asked him. It's the very small town where they go for uh, legislative stuff, and I was just like, "Do you ever like have too many people in the bar? Uh, like when you have a quorum?" He's like, "Oh yeah, we have to count like any time." He's like, "Nope, get out. You have to leave. Sorry, Gary. There's too many people already here." It's illegal. And I'm just like, oh, that, make, that makes me happy. <laughs> like, like, oh, okay, cool. He's like, yes, it's usually someone's job. They have to count all the time to make sure we're not breaking the law. Uh, but here's other great places to get public data. Uh, payroll records, oh boy. Uh, city, county, state, inspection data, health data. So uh, restaurant inspections, you will hate yourself for looking at those, especially at places you enjoy eating at. Uh, you would be surprised how often you are eating cockroaches and rats, or rat droppings. Uh, bridges, uh, our country's infrastructure is incredibly failing. Um, bridges throughout, like, it's something like 50% of all bridges are uh, what are called like, structurally deficient, which means they should be replaced. They're not going to be anytime soon, and they then break. Uh, voter registries, voter registries are great because if you have somebody who's running for public office, uh, are they registered to vote? Have they been registered to vote for a long time? Uh, because if they're like a big public service person, uh, and sometimes some of these things will actually show what elections a person has voted in, not who they voted for, but have they been a regular voter, you can be like, hi, you are running for this position. You have not ever voted for that sort of election. Why should someone vote for you when you yourself aren't engaged in uh, the public process as well? So again, it's something you can use to be able to discuss this sort of stuff uh, with candidates. Um, accident data and calls for service data. Uh, you can find out information about where accidents occur, and you can also throw a census data on it. Is, does it take longer for cops and firefighters to get to neighborhoods uh, that are more poor, that have uh, more minorities? Uh, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel did a big project, and they found, I think it was like double the amount of time to get to some of these neighborhoods. And if I recall correctly, even some of these neighborhoods that had closer fire stations uh, took longer for them to get to. Uh, and even stuff like fixing potholes, it was way faster for Foxhole, or, uh, for those to get fixed in uh, richer neighborhoods. Shocker. But it, sometimes it's like stuff that you, everyone just assumes is happening, but you get the data to actually show it. Um, and that again, shows some of these institutional issues, and systemic issues. Uh, that only starts to get fixed when people shine some light on it. Um, so just with payroll data, you can look at stuff like who's the highest paid person. Sometimes it's the mayor, uh, but oftentimes it's like a it's a medical health professional. Like sometimes they get paid more. Uh, the amount of overtime per person. In a lot of cities, you have like what they say they're going to pay cops, but they actually pay them a lot more because of the mandatory overtime they get. The same thing for like public hospitals and stuff like that. But the problem is if a nurse is working 70, 80 hours a week and getting a ton of extra overtime, there are studies that show after like 45, 50 hours, your cognitive abilities and a bunch of other stuff go out the window. Do you really want nurses and doctors have worse uh, mental uh, acumen? Same thing for police officers and firefighters because it makes you more belligerent, makes you angrier, makes you more prone to violence. Don't really want that in a police officer. But that's just uh, my opinion. Uh, you can also look at uh, m uh, men versus women in terms of how are they being paid for similar positions? Is there salary disparities? You can also compare this with the actual city budget. They said, we're gonna pay $5 million in salaries. That's what they budgeted. Add them all up. Oh, you paid seven. Hmm, why? Uh, how, much, how many people make more than the mayor? That's always fun. Like just figuring that out. Um, and then just be like, hi mayor, um, you're the most important person here. 
why is why is she making more than you? How do you feel? Like it's just like a fun story. Uh, you can also do stuff where you take one database and mash it with another. Uh, public employees who are felons, uh, public employees owing child support, felons who are hunters, political donations, plus public employee data. Now, what I want to point out here is uh, just because someone is a felon or they owe child support does not mean they are a bad person. What this means is, are they falling through the cracks and is the system failing? I did a big project where I found hunters who had uh, uh, gotten um, licenses to hunt and then used a firearm to hunt in Arkansas. They're not supposed to have guns unless they've been given those rights back. So I found 850 of these people that did this. And like I talked with the state, and they're like, oh, huh, wow, thanks. But what it shows is these people are falling through the gaps. Uh, here's a project I did in college uh, where I found uh, where who people were donating to that worked for the University of Nebraska. And as you see, a lot of people donated to Barack Obama, but also remember Thomas Tancredo? Uh, wow, and John Edwards. Uh, but you saw who got what money. Uh, and what you want to do is you want to start to get into what I call a data frame of mind. You start to think of everything as data. So like if you think about a parking ticket, just the act of someone giving you a parking ticket, it's a treasure trove of data. First, you've got the actual ticket. It has a date, time, the offense, like the number of what the actual thing that you did. Um, so maybe it's 101-2 because you parked too long at a meter. Um, it has information on how much it costs, how much it costs uh, if you forget to pay it. It also has a citation number. Maybe it has information on the car, the make, the model, the license plate, where it was parked. And if you go even further, human being issued that ticket. That person has a name, date of birth, social security number, uh, how much they get paid, their, like their benefits, uh, complaints against them, uh, their emails, that sort of stuff. And if, you have enough tickets, you can kind of follow and see what somebody's day and their pattern is like. So you can actually see, like, when do they take lunch breaks? <laughs> now, that sort of stuff. Um, any form that you ever see in a public office is put into a database. Odds are you can get a lot of that data. You can file a records request and get a lot of that data. Uh, so again, going back here, uh, one thing I would also say that a lot of information about data is political. And by political, I mean small p means human beings got together and made a decision. So uh, on this, it's called meter violation. Somebody had to decide that that was called meter violation. Maybe somewhere else it's called like late violation or something like that. Um, in some places, maybe they decided to call your car as a pickup instead of a truck. Because in different parts of the country, we have different terms for stuff like that. And so again, uh, this data is political and uh, that can also lead to bias. So again, humans make data, which means it's fallible, which means the same problems and systemic issues we have go into data as well. And a lot of times these forms, they're very geared toward westernized names, so smaller, shorter names, not longer compound last names. Yeah? Um, you talk a lot about public record mm -hmm. data. I'm currently trying to work on a project on the how music festivals pay women versus how they pay men. But that's private. Yeah. How do you how do you how can you get like private data? Uh, I can answer quickly and we can talk a little bit more in depth after. A quick way of that is doing surveying people. And there's uh, tools you can use where you can use like a Google form. You can ask for people to tell you that sort of stuff. Uh, and sometimes you might ask them it's like, hey you like if you get a bunch of women who do it, be like, can you have your friends who are men also fill this out? Now, it's not scientific, it's not perfect, but it's a way of issue there. Um, and sometimes some of these companies, they like depending on regulatory issues, they have to file shit about that with the state or other entities to be able to prove if they are sometimes following laws that are supposed to help prevent that sort of stuff, that's an avenue to look. So sometimes you might not be able to get it directly, but you can get it from the government body they have to submit information. Especially if they got any public money or something like that. And you might make the argument, um, hey, you use public property and public space to be able to put on your music festival. Why don't you show us this information to prove that you're good stewards of the public's stuff? Um, that's what I would say. Uh, you can also use data to uh, lie. Um, these two things show the exact same information. The one on the left doesn't start at zero. The one on the right starts at zero. So you see this huge jump looks crazy, but it's not as crazy. They do this with stock stocks all the time, and it makes me mad. And the Wall Street Journal does it all the time. They should know better, but um, they do this a lot. So to go to your question, 
public records. Um, success with public records uh, has a lot to deal with attitude. I am from a small Nebraska town. We were born and told, you do not rock the boat. You are very straight laced. Uh, all corn has to be the same size. If any corn is higher, you chop that shit right off. Um, but you have to be not like that good Midwestern boy sometimes. You have to have a little bit of an attitude. And it's nice but firm. Assume it's public and free. So in this case, just assume they're going to give it to you. Uh, it's the public's information, and you're a member of the public, therefore give it to me. Be nice but firm. Uh, forget you're a Midwesterner. If you're not, you're probably doing great. Uh, <laughs> New Yorkers are way better at getting uh, records uh, than us Midwesterners. Um, one of the first things to do is just ask. Call and assume you're going to get it and talk to a human being and explain what you're trying to get. Um, talk to the nerds. Find the people that actually do stuff with the data. Like You might call like the public information officer. They have no reason to help you. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they are helpful. But if it's with data, they usually don't understand it, they don't know it, and they usually just throw you, throw you away. Go through a phone tree and find somebody whose name is like data technician two. Call him or her and be like, hey, I'm trying to get this. And sometimes people are like, oh my god, a human being is talking to me. <laughs> I would love to give you this thing that I work on all day that no one ever uses. And sometimes they'll just give it to you. And, or sometimes they'll be like, hey, can you request it exactly like this to this person? Then I'll have to give it to you. Um, so file a records request asking for an electronic version. A lot of times they want to give you a paper version because they know that's worthless to you, especially if it's if it's like spreadsheet data. Uh, government usually has to prove that it's not public. A lot of times they'll just be like, we're not supposed to give that to you. And I go, cool, cite the law. Show me in the law where it says you can't give it to me. And they go, well, we don't want to, it's hard. Oh, is that in the law, that it's too hard? Oh, it's not. Give it to me. Why are you letting them break the law? Uh, I like to have, when I used to be a reporter, I had an asking schedule. I asked for certain stuff on a regular basis. So much so that when I would call them, they would go, we already have it for you, Jesus. So we're just going to email it to you. We're just going to send it to you on Mondays, okay? Uh, you create a spreadsheet of your request so you can track your stuff. Again, be persistent but patient. There was a, a project the Chicago Tribune did. It took 18 months to get this data. They had to file lawsuits. They had to get the attorney general to fight. Uh, they had to file another lawsuit after the attorney general said yes to get a list of some of these students that were getting preferred uh, attendee uh, access to the University of Illinois uh, because it was a bunch of rich people's kids. And the school was like, shit, we don't want that out there. But again, make them cite the law and always ask for electronic versions. There's a bunch of excuses. It's too hard. Oh, it's too hard part of the law? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. If it isn't, no, no, you get paid to do this work. I guess you gotta do your job. Um, don't act like that. But <laughs> think like that and then say, you know, it's the old acting technique, like don't shout fuck, think it, and be like, darn it, but think it. Uh, unless you're doing mammoth. Yeah, exactly, yeah, unless you're doing mammoth. Um, the main person is out of town. I hear that all the time. I go, okay, what if the governor wanted this right now? Who would do it then? Oh, Beth? Have Beth do it. Uh, their system can't export the data. You mean to tell me you spent, well, well first you'd ask, how much did you spend on this, on this equipment? $12 million a year, cool. You mean to tell me you bought shitty software? Was it your decision? <laughs> how much do you make a year? Also, what's your boss's uh, name and information? Because boy, what a fun story. I was just gonna do this other thing, but now I'm gonna write about governmental <laughs> malfeasance. Oh, you're gonna email it to me right now. Thank you. It's not public, prove it. Prove that it's not public, and sometimes it is. And sometimes parts of it are public. I had, I, I had a fight that I won in Arkansas where they said, the law said birth date. I can't give you birth date. So I said, what if you get rid of the, the day of the month, but give me year and month? And the lawyer on the phone was just like, ho, 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 that's some good shit. I can do that. Because <laughs> the law says birth date. It, does, it says nothing about birth month or, or birth year. Uh, the records have confidential information, again, is it in the is it in the law? Like, does it? Because usually there are exceptions for confidential information. Usually, confidential information is just another way of them saying this shit uh, is going to make us look bad. Uh, if we give it to you, we got to give it to everyone. Yeah, please do. <laughs> You're just looking for dirt on us. That's when you go. Is there dirt? <laughs> you can just tell us what it is right now. Let's just like jump to that. Um, but again, what you say is like. 
if we find something, we're going to be good journalists and come to you and, and make sure we're not getting it wrong. That's the thing I always tell. It's like, if we find anything, we're going to talk to you about it. Like, we don't just print shit without discussing it. And usually we go in depth to make sure we are really understanding this correctly. We don't keep it electronically. In 2018, you don't keep shit electronically. Well, there's a fun story. Uh, what are you going to do with it? I don't know. Maybe nothing. Tough shit. Give it to me. Uh, that will cost you $12 million. I've gotten told that amount for searching for emails. Um, that's usually bullshit. Uh, and you have to make them break down that number. And then if they do that, call like a technical person in their company uh, and have them tell you, oh, dude, I can do that like in the afternoon. Oh, cool. Uh, I'm going to call your boss. I got told that once. I was like, do it. He's going to be like really excited that like, I'm, like, I'm working extra hard. <laughs> uh, so keep that data frame of mind. Learn data retention policies. When you're bored, file a request. Just file one. Just get bored and just start doing it. File one to two a week. I know some people that would file one every single day. And then all it takes a while, but all of a sudden shit just starts coming in. And you're working on projects. And all of a sudden you're just like, I'm bored. Oh, here's that data I got on labor stuff. Oh my god! And you find something, and now you have a project. Because you ever had like those reporters in your newsroom? They always have shit. They always have great stories. It's because they're assholes doing this stuff. Um, not assholes. I was one of those assholes. Um, they're they're talented reporters who have uh, doggedness to be able to do this stuff. So ABR always be requesting. Going back to Mr. Mamet. Um, fun fact: Public universities have a lot of great data you can request. Purchasing cards are wonderful stuff to get from city, state, county organizations. They show you what they're spending money on. Ooh. Uh, gas cards, same deal. Emails. Um, we don't really have time to go through all of this other stuff that I had in here. Uh, but uh, yeah, like data can be used in a different way. This is, like, I think, the final thing I have time to show you. Just a project at the Boston Globe where we found five cases of uh, people who were paroled or not paroled um, who were murderers. And we wanted you to decide what would you do. And then we showed you what the actual result was and what happened after that person was paroled. Because it was a big campaign issue. Um, and so it's like, yes, grant parole. Uh, the board voted and has had no known violations. No, deny parole. Parole, violated parole and return to prison. So again, it's taking data, telling a story, and using it to, to do something. So uh, I'm literally out of time. But I will be here for a little while longer if you want to keep talking. But um, I will zip to the end, maybe, of one of these if you need my contact information. But I also have cards and stuff up here. And, uh, and will the video will be available? Yes. Will your slides be available to uh, The slides, uh, I can give you a version of these slides. These ones I'm allowed to share. The ones from previous talks, those I'm not. This one, I can. Okay. So email me, and I can share you some of that stuff. And also this video and all that will be available. But, okay. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. You're good. Yeah,